Joe's comments. We are going to start a little bit late, but we will make up the time a little bit later. Um, so uh, we are going to be your MCs, for better or for worse, for the day. We are going to have a lot of fun. It's going to be a really, really interesting conference, and we'll tell you about that. So um, I'm, I'm Danny Sands, and uh, you'll be hearing from me later, but I'm a primary care doctor, and I work in health information technology, but that's not important. What's really most important is that I am uh, one of the founders, and I am the co-chair, along with uh, Joe Trudulo of the Society for Participatory Medicine. Um, and uh, I think that uh, the other thing I'd like to say is that participatory medicine, when we founded this organization, we really thought about, long and hard about how we wanted to make healthcare different, how we wanted to change the way healthcare worked. We really felt that healthcare was not working correctly, it wasn't working for anybody very well, not for patients or caregivers, or even for healthcare professionals. And so we created this organization, the Society for Participatory Medicine. There were 12 of us who created this, and, and we wanted to create an organization that was uh, welcoming to people of all different uh, uh, aspects, people who are patients, people who are caregivers, people who are healthcare professionals, and people who touch healthcare in many other ways. Such as people with, uh, you know, who work in the healthcare industry in any way, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, healthcare attorneys, educators, what have you. So participatory medicine means different things to different people, but to me, it means a way of thinking about healthcare in which healthcare is thought of not as a service industry, but as a collaboration, a collaboration between the patient and the healthcare professional where the topic of that collaboration is the patient's health. Um, and I guess the last thing I'm supposed to say is uh, what I'd like you to get out of this conference today. And what I want you to get out of this conference today is I want you to come away with new ideas about how you're gonna make participatory medicine a reality, both in your lives, but also in, in the healthcare system writ large. That's what I want to come out of this. And I want you to connect with people. We have a lot of networking time here embedded in the conference intentionally because we want you to make new connections, meet new people, find out what they're doing, find out how you can work together. Bert? Hello. <laughs> I'm Bert Rosen, and I'm the president for the Society for Participatory Medicine for the year. Uh, and first, I have to say good morning to all the participatorians. That's a, you know, it's, a, it's a word we tried to make up last year, but I think participatorians is it's the equivalent adjective of, you know, of, it's a mouthful of an adjective, like Society for Participatory Medicine is a mouthful of a name. So uh, good morning to everybody. So um, like Danny said, uh, uh, you know, I'm here for a lot of reasons. So I've been the president for about a year, and, and the reason why it matters to me is a few reasons. So one, just a network of people. What I found being a member is I've met a lot of people and I've had a lot of great conversations about different things we can do together. And I would argue the strength for the society is really the people that it brings together and the conversations that it can start. So um, that's a big part of why I'm here. I think the other part of why I'm here really is, is fairly personal in that uh, my family has had a lot of health issues and one of the things I found pretty early on is that there wasn't one person who could help all of our health issues. And, uh, I can say that this is not the room, but my wife is here too, who's about to be here. Uh, but she, she's amazing and she, uh, when my kids had certain issues, she became an expert in those issues and like a real lay person expert in those issues and became a real partner for the, for the care teams that we had and for a lot of the healthcare professionals we worked with and I saw what the impact that a, um, a caregiver and a patient could really make on the system, and, and that really inspired me. That's that's why I'm here today. And um, so, what I hope you get out of this conference is, uh, I hope you meet a lot of people you haven't met before, and I, I really hope you talk to a lot of people. We we have a lot of great speakers today, and uh, consciously, what we didn't want was a, a meeting for the day where everybody just sat in front of just PowerPoints, right? That's nobody likes that. Or I don't know. I don't like that. I think it'll be for everybody. Uh, 
Um, so what we were hoping is that we would have people who were great at telling the story, people who would evoke emotion, and people who would give you things to talk about and would really cause some conversation. So um, we have some topics like later on this afternoon, we have a panel about social determinants, right? Which is not always, always the easiest. And that's like, we hope that that sparks a lot of conversation. And much like Danny said, we want everyone to talk about how to uh, make participatory medicine real, but we also want, honestly, right? We want people to have conversations that help change healthcare for someone. Because if you can change healthcare for a person, you can already improve the system for someone. So that's why I'm here, and that's what I'm hoping you guys get out of today. So I am apparently really good at housekeeping, so I get to do the housekeeping part of the opening. Um, so first off, uh, you see the hashtag, and the hashtag is not SPM. The hashtag is S4PM2019. Right, Dave? Yeah. Right? Thank you. Uh, sure. Um, SPM is another organization in another part of the world, and it doesn't really work when we use that hashtag. So the number four is important. We'll be tweeting um, a lot today. There's already been tweets to the hashtag. And for those on Facebook Live, if you uh, want to follow through Twitter, just follow that hashtag too. And we encourage people to tweet as much as possible because it's just another way to get the conversation going. Uh, we talked about Facebook Live a little bit. We are streaming on Facebook Live. Chris Baker, who is our star streamer, is not in the room, but, but he comes oh, he comes back in. Oh, thank you, never takes his off. It's okay. No, he might not come right back in. Anyway, so he's streaming for us today, so thanks to Chris. And for all of you on Facebook Live, uh, Chris is your lifeline to the conference today. Um, Wi-Fi is, uh, I was told, we don't really need to tell anybody, because it's C4, it's what, wireless. C4 wireless with no code involved. Everybody needs the Wi-Fi. Um, on the table, you see a number of things. You'll see agendas for the day. You'll see some uh, literature on the journal. And then you'll also see some cards, which we're calling our manifesto cards, because it's our manifesto on a card, uh, which we'll go into in a little bit in more detail. I want to give a huge shout out. This is, I think, uh, getting bigger for us, but we actually have a number of students in the room. Shout out to some of our nursing students over there. <laughs> So, the American College of Radiology, 
uh, Kairos, which, who is a lunch sponsor, Patients Like Me, breakfast sponsor, Salem Oaks, Inspire, We Go Health, Health Spark, Backpack Health, Psych Central, OpenMD.com, DSP Global, and Conversa Health. There's a sign back there. Um, walk up to people, again, when you're meeting people, thank our sponsors, because we really do appreciate that. Um, all right, special uh, thanks to one of our sponsors for an unusual thing that they're able to do for us. So Backpack Health uh, has supported our press releases, which included press release of release about the conference. So I want to make a special call out to Backpack Health for their help on that. Um, next, I want to recognize that there are a lot of people who are here, and I won't ask you to stand, because, you, because we have a really neat program at the Society called the Travel Awards. So when the society was created, we really didn't want there to be any barriers to participating in the society for participatory medicine. So besides the fact that our dues are really low, and if you need a, a, a you know, financial aid so that you don't have to pay the dues, we grant that, no questions asked. Uh, we also uh, uh, try to keep the cost down at conferences, but we also have a travel award so that anybody who is, is struggling with paying for go, uh, visiting our conference or any medical conference for that matter, um, can, can apply for a travel award and get a travel stipend to help them uh, defray those costs. So I think it's a really great program. And I don't know, do we have any of our travel award committee over in the room? It was on it. Okay, should we? <laughs> Janice, was on it. Was. Janice, stand up and be recognized. <laughs> That's great. And next, I want to mention another thing. Uh, one of our longtime friends, not a sponsor because they're a small nonprofit, is a company uh, run by Lisa Valtteri called uh, Recycle Health. And uh, Recycle Health, uh, and I'm going to mangle this a little bit, but Recycle Health takes all these fitness trackers that many of us have and get rid of when we get the next generation of trackers, and they repurpose them and make them available to people who can't otherwise afford these devices. So I think they're really serving an important need. Now, today we have a special thing because it turns out that Lisa has informed us that she has uh, an extra amount of some fitness trackers that are actually new, is that right? They're actually new fitness trackers that were a donation. And she will provide them to people who need them, first come, first serve. And Lisa, raise your hand. Lisa's here with the golden hair. And uh, Lisa, um, with, with Recycle Health, will be giving them out. Find her at lunchtime, and that's when she'll be doing that, okay? All right? Okay, good. So, yeah. Okay. All right, next I have uh, something else to say, which is that I was talking a little bit about the, um, the, uh, the society and its founding. So as I said, there were about a dozen of us who created this society a while ago, recognizing that healthcare wasn't what we wanted it to be, and we wanted to make it different, and we knew that somehow the internet was a big piece of how patients could get more engaged in their health, and we needed to encourage, of course, healthcare professionals, healthcare systems to release data. The point is, is that this is our 10th year. We've been doing this for 10 years, and when we started, as much of a mouthful as it was, Nobody really heard of this term, participatory medicine. And now, it's just something that people talk about. It's become a term of art. So that's uh, certainly very exciting to us. So I want to wish us a happy 10th anniversary. And, and all of you were part of this. Many of you were part of this. And uh, I, I, won't add, I won't go through the exercise and say who was with you, organization for 10 years, nine years. We don't do all that. But a lot of you have been uh, a big key part of this. And if you've been just engaged in the last couple of years and rolling up your sleeves and working with us, that's great. If it's been since the beginning, of course, that's great too. <laughs> but one of the things we wanted to do to celebrate our 10th anniversary is have a short video uh, about what we do and what we've done and where we're going. And so I want to recognize Eric Birch. Where is Eric? Eric, stand up, please, for those. So Eric is an award-winning uh, videographer, producer, and he has uh, done some great work, and we actually hired Eric to actually put together a, a, a short video for us. So I will tell you there's a, a little problem with the title. We have uh, a Brennan Hodge and, uh, and uh, Doug Lindsay. Their titles were switched, but this is a, not the final version, but I did want to share it because we're very excited about it. So give us two minutes of your time. Okay. Thank you. 
founded uh, 10 years ago. What they said at the beginning, the initial definition is that participatory medicine is a movement. The idea of us coming together and deciding right. on a, a new healthcare system, that's something that needs to happen. We wanted to just transform healthcare. I know this is culture change, and it takes a generation or more to change culture, but I'm impatient. I think our ultimate goal is to transform it to the point at which participatory health is the way we practice. It's not patients saying doctors, you're wrong. It's, it's patients saying doctors, let, let's work together and vice versa. Because we only spend a very little amount of time in front of a doctor and we spend the rest of our time managing our lives and our conditions on our own. And what happens is that we, both patients and healthcare professionals, are thinking about healthcare as if it's this car wash with the patient cruising passively through the healthcare system, getting health sprinkled on them, and somehow coming out the other side healthy. To advance collaboration between patients and doctors is to demonstrate factually to them both just how important it is to have that partnership. Sounds like a broken record, but it's not a difficult concept. Let patients help. It's a society for participatory medicine, but you could almost call it the participatory society of participatory medicine. <laughs> The make or break issue for the next decade of this society will be whether we are able to f set our minds on one metric. Ten years from now, I anticipate that we will see stakeholders from many different areas coming together from clinicians to patients. And that metric is how well the world is changing. If you ask me, that's not my ultimate goal. I want this to be uh, such an incredible movement that we change the world. We'll have researchers, entrepreneurs, startups, as well as frontline staff all coming together to really decide and determine the trajectory of healthcare. We have a tremendous number of thought leaders in participatory medicine who are part of our, our society, and we're all plugged into social media. So we're trying to change hearts and minds that way. We will be seeing a whole lot of new apps and ways to move our data around. It's not accomplished fact yet, but I'll tell you, it's going to help us take care of our parents and ourselves. So there's lots of opportunity looking forward to advance the tenets of participatory medicine. Let's get to work and say, what's it going to take, you know, to produce more change than we have produced in the past decade? Being involved in a larger vision and being involved in a mission and an activity that has a lot of potential to help others is something that I really find compelling. I think that the future is very exciting. We're really at a reflection point. I'm excited about what we can do over the next, uh, the next 10 years. So anyhow, with that, to uh, set the tone for the day, I'm going to now hand this over to Bert to introduce our first speaker. Um, just as a quick note, as a marketing person, we will not be renaming the society to the participatory society. <laughs> okay, he's going to open the next deck while we should say. Um, a few things uh, to know today about the speakers. So one, like I mentioned before, the goal today is really to generate conversation between everybody in the room and everybody with the speaker. So you'll find that we'll do a speaker and then we'll have Q&A time afterwards. So there'll be plenty of time for Q&A afterwards. So I'm very excited to introduce the first speaker. Um, oh, I'm sorry, Vincent, one other thing you'll find on introduction is that we're trying not to read bios. Like for the speakers, if they're interested, obviously you can go to their LinkedIn or read their own profile. So, we wanted to make it a little bit more personal, so I'm very excited to introduce our first speaker, Maggie Breslin, who's really a storyteller. She has, she has a lot of great reasons for being a storyteller. She's lived in uh, 10 states and moved 13 times. Right, moved, wow, that's a lot of stories. 
That's a lot of, that's a lot of stories right there. And she also has her first career in film and animation and interactive, all storytelling mediums, which um, she's able to use all of that to really help uh, improve uh, the healthcare world through Casey storytelling, et cetera. So I'm going to hand off to Maggie to kick us off for the day. Oh, she's <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's uh, top secret, if you can figure it out. <laughs> ruh, ruh. Um, well, I can go ahead and kind of uh, start to get started here. Oh, maybe it's just oh, there it is. some of you um, may have heard of. One of my uh, collaborators, the chair of that organization, is uh, a fellow by the name of Victor Montori, um, who some of you may have, uh, have um, uh, had some interactions with in the past. And one of the places that I really wanted to start in talking about kind of who I am and how I came to do the work of Patient Revolution is to really ground the fact, or sort of start with the fact, that I do not come to the work that I do um, with a background as a clinician. Um, I have spent a lot of time in um, healthcare facilities, but um, not as a, a person by the bedside. Um, I also don't come to this work through a kind of patient advocate kind of point of view. Um, and uh, instead, the kind of place that I come to it is as a background as a designer and a researcher. Um, and I started working in healthcare as a designer and researcher about 15 years ago. Um, when I began working uh, in that role at the Mayo Clinic. Um, and uh, we can grab my computer too. <laughs> um, uh, about 15 years ago. And um, what was, uh, that was the place where I started to kind of discover um, what my kind of interest and the opportunities I think within um, healthcare might be. And, my role kind of as a researcher, what I really bring to it is my way of understanding areas or challenges or um, issues related to healthcare is really through observation and interviews. It's by going out and watching and then talking to people as a way of really kind of understanding and, and kind of grounding um, uh, that understanding in the kind of reality of human experience. Um, and then the part of the, the designer, the piece that I, I bring to it is once I've kind of developed that understanding, is to then use my design to make something as a way to respond or kind of build um, build a possible future um, into that kind of new new zone or kind of new space. And so that's really the kind of practice that I've brought to the patient revolution, whose kind of mission and, and goal um, is uh, an action and advocacy organization for careful and kind care. Um, and I, I can kind of get in get into that, we'll get into that a little bit here. Do you want me to try and grab my computer?
star for this type of work. And so, does that work? Yeah, great. Um, so, uh, so this was just, a, the, these are a couple of examples of, of kind of uh, the work or things that I've been involved in to give you a little bit of a sense of what that kind of research and design piece kind of looks like um, in terms of developing the understanding and then kind of thinking about what can be made in sort of response to that. And so, like I said, um, I thought for the exercise that we would go through today was really grounded in this idea of conversation. And I think, um, for me, one of the enormous opportunities that I've had working within healthcare as a designer and a researcher has been the opportunity to see um, hundreds of interactions, hundreds of conversations that clinicians and patients have, have kind of had with each other. And I find that they are, um, so useful in helping me understand what it is that we're really trying to do with healthcare. And so what I thought we would do today is kind of use this a little bit as a grounding mechanism as we kind of go through the talk. And the reason why I think this is so important is because I believe this is true, that care happens in conversation. Um, that conversation is essentially the vessel through which um, clinicians and patients come together and they, um, process uh, emotions and uh, physical issues and intellectual issues, and the way that they kind of come together and figure out, okay, what are we gonna do in response to a problem? Um, and so what I wanna do as we kind of start today is ask all of you to think for a second and identify a conversation that stands out to you in your mind some uh, interaction uh, with a clinician that you can remember. It could be for yourself, it could be for a family member, um, and I want you to be one that's positive, it could be one that's negative, and I want you to just spend a couple of seconds kind of keeping that in your mind. I'm gonna ask you to kind of come back to it as we move through the kind of exercises of the sort of discussion here this morning, um, and to think a little bit about what did you talk about? How did you talk with each other? What are the things that you remember um, or that seem really meaningful to you from that particular interaction? Um, because those are the things that I want to, you to kind of bring to the discussion that we're gonna have. And so this is kind of the agenda that I put up, uh, that I, I kind of thought I would walk us through, is um, to really ground in this idea of conversation. So conversations as possibility, and then thinking about conversations and the problems of industrial healthcare. Um, thinking about conversations and what it can help us understand about a movement for careful and kind patient care, and then also conversations as a place of action, um, and what does that potentially look like. So conversations as possibility. Um, one of the very first uh, projects that I worked on um, when I started working in healthcare, so this was around 2005, about 14 years, 14, 15 years ago, um, was to uh, think about a, to develop a conversation tool that can help patients engage in the discussion and the decision making around their medications, patients with type 2 diabetes. And so I started by going out into exam rooms and observing, and what I found was that there wasn't much conversation that was happening. And most of the visits were the same. Uh, at some point, the physicians would say, I think you need to be on a medication, uh, you should probably be on metformin, here's the prescription, and they would hand it to the patient, the patient would leave the visit with it, and it was sometime after that, after they had left that room, when a patient would make a decision about that medication. They would make a decision when they bothered to get it filled, or if they did get it filled, if they took it the way it was kind of prescribed. And they were sort of doing all of their decision making kind of in that moment. And so what we ended up doing was we created a tool um, that we call Diabetes Issues Cards. And here's a little kind of preview of them that we brought into the clinical encounter. They included a number of different medications and each, the issue cards were things like cough, daily routine, uh, daily monitoring, uh, low blood sugar. Um, and the idea was that the physician would sort of, or the clinician would present these cards and ask the patient, uh, which issue would you like to discuss first? And so really the idea of the tool was it created a space uh, for patients to engage in a conversation with their clinician about their type 2 diabetes medication um, that didn't have 
uh, it didn't center around A1C. And we, the team that I was working with, we ran a clinical trial for this. And one of the stories that came out of the clinical trial is one that I come back to a lot. And so there was a, uh, a 90, uh, like a 92-year-old uh, man who was seeing his family physician. He, he'd been seeing his physician for a number of years. Uh, he was randomized into the trial. Um, he was, his wife had passed away a few years ago and this gentleman was right on the cusp of moving into uh, assisted living. And so he came in and he was with his physician and his physician asked, um, which, of, which of these issues would you like to start, you know, start discussing? And um, the patient said, uh, weight effect. And the, the, the physician was kind of like, uh, okay. Um, you're like 92, I don't know what we're, we're necessarily kind of thinking about, but he said, okay, well, so what, what about weight effects? And the patient said, well, I'm about to move into this assisted living facility, and there's all sorts of beautiful ladies there. <laughs> <laughs> and then the physician kind of laughed, and he said, okay, well, um, they looked at the, at the sheet, and one of the drugs that was uh, had some weight loss sort of associated with it was an injectable. And so the physician said, well, this one has weight loss associated with it, but it is an injectable. I don't know how you would feel about that. And he said, well, that would be fine. The nurses are the ones who give you injections in the nursing home mm -hmm. from the assisted living facility, and they're cute too. <laughs> <laughs> and the physician kind of laughed. And, the, and all of a sudden, even though it was a patient he had known for years, there was a dialogue, there was an exchange that was different. This was a number of years ago, and that medication was much newer at the time, and so it wasn't on this patient's kind of formulary. And so the physician actually had to go and do extra work, make extra phone calls, um, in order to be able to try and get this patient this medication. But he was invested. He saw that he saw he could do something. He could care for the patient that was in front of him. And so when people ask me, what does careful and kind care look like? I often say it looks like that. And it doesn't mean we create that exact interaction for every patient, but it means that we're creating an environment and supporting those types of dialogues, those types of exchanges that then allow for care to be shaped around um, the lives of patients. And so because this was one of my first projects that I worked on kind of within the healthcare space, what this really taught me, and I think the reason why I come back to conversations a lot, is that conversations are a place of possibility. That there is an opportunity to shift what we do um, and change the way that conversations are happening um, in healthcare. And that is something that I think is critical uh, to thinking about um, action and how do we begin to take action. So as time has passed and I've kind of moved forward and now within the patient revolution, we're sort of thinking about what, what is the problem with the patient revolution and the idea of careful and kind care are designed to respond to. And they're designed to respond to the problem of industrial healthcare. Um, and my colleague, Victor Montori, has a, a really great talk that he gives, especially from sort of a clinician point of view, around what industrial healthcare is and what are kind of the problems of it. But I'm gonna kind of recreate a little bit of that, but again, reframed around this conversation. So now if we take the lens of industrial healthcare and we're back in this exam room again with, with a clinician and with a patient, and now what are we doing or thinking? How would we look at this particular interaction. Well now in this interaction, the person on the left is not a clinician, they're a provider. And they're a provider who is delivering care. And in this version, care is a product, which is, we can tell because we had to make care a noun and introduce another verb, which we don't really have to do because care is already a verb. <laughs> but now, Care is something that these two people are producing, the product of care. And once it's been created in their exchange and in their back and forth, the institution will take that product and will turn to the payer and will say, here's what we made. Is this of high enough quality? Is this of low enough cost? And this way of looking at healthcare, of looking at conversations, has repercussions. 
that when we have designed the system to create a care product, then we have to we have to do things to allow that to happen. We have to limit the problems, the options, and the actions that are potentially available. I'm sure a lot of you have experienced this in terms of um, you'll the uh, the provider will only be able to address one or two of your issues today. No matter how many you have, you have to narrow them down. We all feel it in terms of limiting time and limiting resources. So I only have 10 minutes. I only can, uh, you're talking about sort of, um, you mentioned that you're talking about social determinants of health later today. That's a real challenge, right? I don't wanna bring up something I can't do anything about. So we limit the conversations that we're willing to have based on what we feel comfortable or available to, to provide. And we also limit the information and stories that we ask patients to bring into that space. So it's very often that patients feel that um, stories that, about things that may be going on in their lives, the struggles that they may be having, anxiety related to divorce or related to work, things that are absolutely impacting their health, but in their mind, they don't fall under the, the umbrella of something a clinician can do something about, and therefore they don't belong in this space. So patients self-censor. And this has repercussions. So when this happens, patients become a blur. They feel unseen and kind of unheard. They cease to be a full person. We either see them too close in terms of we see them as a number, a lab result, or a biopsy, or we see them too far away as a statistic, uh, a person like you in a relationship to a population health kind of concept. Um, and then clinicians also, this impacts clinicians as well, but they feel a loss. Uh, clinicians go, I believe the number of people who stood up who are students, I'm sure if we were to pull you, kind of ask you today, the students who go into this work who want to be clinicians are pursuing a calling. Um, and when we design healthcare in an industrial way, we limit the ability to kind of uh, draw or to engage in that calling. And that is leading to an epidemic of burnout. And the other thing is somebody, uh, or in the, um, I think uh, Dave was mentioning in the video, the idea of kind of metrics, right? So what are the things that we look at to kind of understand, um, or maybe less metrics and more heuristics? Um, to me, conversation is a really interesting heuristic to look at, to understand kind of what's happening. And in industrial healthcare, conversations start to look more the same. Because that's the goal. That's how you make it into a product. So, recognizing that that's the world that we're living in now and being concerned about the trends that may be um, embedding that even deeper into the, the world that we live in, um, the patient revolution is really designed to try and shift the, the movement and the focus away from an industrial health care and towards careful and kind patient care. So, potentially, what, what would that look like? So here we are again. It's like uh, Groundhog's Day. Just shake that up. Now we're back. We're back in the exam room with a, a patient and a clinician. And so now here we are within the frame of careful and kind patient care. So we think about this in this in this version. We have a clinician and a patient who are coming together because of a problem. The patient's experiencing a problem, and they're going to figure out what to do about it. Not limiting that, but acknowledging that the patients, the way that patients are feeling and experiencing their problems is a valid place to start. Um, and that the goal of healthcare is to figure out what can we together imagine that we do in response to that. That these two people, if they're coming together, um, are not answering to an outside party. They're not answering to a payer, but they're, uh, they're in service of each other. They're answering to each other. And that that's really where that focus should be. So how do we begin, so what does this look like? How does it, how does it begin to manifest? So we have unhurried conversations rather than limits on time and resources, which isn't long conversations necessarily, but it's conversations 
that are designed and we are looking to bring people together for the amount of time that they need in order to address the problems and the challenges that they may be facing. The solutions that they're looking to identify are those which make intellectual, practical, and emotional sense. Intellectual meaning that they're grounded in evidence-based practice. Um, practical meaning that they can fit into a patient's um, life and be sustained over time. Uh, and emotional meaning that they acknowledge and attend to the emotional component of uh, treatment and illness. Um, and that we recognize that just because it would potentially be more convenient, we can't divorce those things from the experience of um, illness and care. And we allow fully into the conversation not only the patient's biology, their lab tests and uh, results of other exams and imaging studies, but also their biography. Who are they? What's going on in their lives? That we recognize that that information is just as important to be in that space um, as the numbers. And when this happens, when we're able to bring clinicians and patients together in this way, we can feel, they feel, patients begin to feel seen and heard. Clinicians feel that they're pursuing their calling. They care, they're able to kind of care for others. I would argue that this, um, this model between he, these two, uh, the story that I told you at the beginning, the 92-year-old gentleman and his clinician, they felt like this. And then the conversations that you see, if you were to peek in um, and see this clinician and patient coming together, those conversations reflect individual experiences. They make good stories, right? Because they have that unique aspect which grounds them into a person's context of life. So, I'm sure many of you, um, as, as, we've, uh, kind of, as we've sort of pursued the work of the patient revolution, um, are probably thinking, yes, that's what I want. Um, careful and kind patient care. How do, we, how do we begin to make that happen? Um, and that's really kind of this idea, this kind of seeing conversations as a place for action. Um, and how do we begin to kind of move ourselves towards this future? I don't want to um, claim in any way that we have figured this out. <laughs> Um, 100%. But this is, uh, again, as our um, work as observers and as um, designers, um, as people who seek to understand and then seek to make in response to that, this is a place that we're really interested in trying to um, imagine uh, with others how do we begin to kind of build this future. And so once again, we kind of come back, conversations as place of action. So one, one way we can think about this is the, the place kind of small between the clinician and patient. So this person and uh, this patient and this clinician, um, what can they, within the constraints and space that they may have, what can they begin to do? And we've created, and some of our partners have created some tools that potentially help to do this type of work. Um, uh, even though it is really small, but recognizing that it can have huge impacts um, for uh, clinicians and patients. And so one tool that we created is a plan your conversation tool. Uh, it's generic, it's condition agnostic, it's a set of five cards, and the five cards have the starts of sentences. Um, I wanna talk about, it's important to me because it might help you to know, I, hope, I want this conversation to lead to, and I'm nervous this time. And we, we created it initially because we were really interested in the idea of what could we do that would allow patients to practice a conversation before they have to have it with a clinician. And so this was our kind of like most lo-fi version um, that people could use. Uh, they could fill out the cards. We encouraged them to say it out loud to somebody else um, or at least say it out loud to themselves. There's enormous power in hearing yourself say something out loud. Um, and then we found that just a simple framework like this can, uh, can lead to a certain amount of sort of self-discovery that then um, can help patients make that bridge um, in, into, that, uh, into the conversation with the clinician. Um, our partners uh, at Mayo Clinic in uh, Victor's research group, the, the care unit, have created a tool called ICANN, 
um, which is designed to uh, solicit kind of information and input uh, about a patient's life that can then become part of the conversation. And one of the most powerful innovations that, that it has done is that it has all of these dimensions, your family, your friends, your work, your finances, your spirituality, where you live, and it asks you, asks you to identify if that is a source of satisfaction, or a burden, or both. And the both is the place that really kind of opens it up. Because in talking with patients, you often find that this is a sentiment that they would love to be able to communicate, but they really struggle to be able to do that. There really is a very little mechanism for it. But they often are looking for ways to say, this is important to me, but it's also hard. I know you asked me to eat better, and I'm trying, but I'm not doing it perfectly. Um, and so tools that can help kind of support that type of dialogue, incredibly helpful. On the right-hand side here, you can see um, Another, this is a, a, a tool for talking about depression medications. It's similar to the one that we created for um, diabetes medications. Um, these are all, uh, you know, simple, simple little tools um, that can kind of fit into care as it exists right now, which you know really is defined by that kind of industrial agenda. I think there's a real limit to what these can do because. Um, by and large, I don't think that the problems of um, healthcare today are um, uh, bad patients or bad clinicians. They're not patients who aren't doing as much as they should or clinicians that aren't doing as much as they should. They're good clinicians and good patients caught in a system that's not very supportive of them. Um, but I think that these do show, again, that there is a place of action. There is opportunity within conversations um, to begin to introduce maybe a small bit of information that doesn't sort of, uh, that isn't present there right now. Um, then kind of we've also tried to imagine beyond that. So um, outside of this exam room, what does it begin to look like if we're trying to imagine how do we affect change in these conversations? And we're really interested in the idea of how are we supporting skills and resources and support for the practice of kind of both of these people. And of course the, um, the idea of supporting this for clinicians, I think there's a little bit more of a history here um, in terms of medical education uh, and uh, continuing medical education and communication <coughs> skills. And even though I think there's enormous opportunities to do uh, more forward thinking work in those spaces, um, but the idea is what can we be doing that helps to support how clinicians think and feel and talk with their patients. Um, and what skills and resources might enable them to begin to do that more. But the other area that I think is potentially even more interesting is how do we begin to do that for patients? Um, and we haven't necessarily in the past thought about investing in um, skills and resources and kind of support to help patients develop their communication skills so that they can be part of this, um, this kind of scenario. And so that's one place, one area where we've begun to kind of explore um, what this might look like. So we've been um, developing as kind of an extension of our, some of our shared decision-making work, um, these kind of community peer events uh, around different topics. We've said that they're kind of modeled on Tupperware parties. Um, they mostly happen, uh, and because of, maybe also because our initial ones have been with women, but they mostly happen in people's homes or maybe libraries um, or uh, other spaces, but not clinical spaces. Um, and the idea is that somebody hosts, this is where the Tupperware party idea kind of comes from, and we bring, um, they'll invite from their social network and bring together a group of people, and we create a space that's outside of the clinical <coughs> environment um, for people to begin to uh, think and feel and talk about what may be important to them around a topic um, so they can start to work through that before they find themselves in a doctor's office or a clinical <coughs> space having to make a decision about it. Um, and so we've been doing this around cardiovascular health for women um, and really uh, engaging. Uh, we have a cardiologist who joins us and who's partnered with us for, at Yale for this work. Um, and it's been really interesting. I, I realized after we started doing these prototypes that um, uh, there's kind of no space where people can come
come together and just ask a lot of questions of like a cardiologist around the kind of a frame of information that most of our medical education or patient education is framed as a lecture. Here's information and I'm giving you this information, but it doesn't necessarily kind of inspire this type of dialogue. And so we really designed this around um, helping people kind of have information around some of the um, issues that we have evidence related to, but it's, um, but it's not gonna go into the kind of calculator about what their sort of, sort of health is. So it might be related to the exercise diet, their family history, stress, um, their pregnancy experiences, their uh, kind of menopause experiences. And it's a really interesting space to have people be able to ask questions and people to be able to kind of learn. Um, we haven't been able to tie it to the conversations yet, but I'm really interested in understanding for the women who may engage in this, when they do then go and talk to their clinician about cardiovascular health, do they, do they feel more confident? Do they have the ability to draw some information about their um, biography that may be relevant and important? Um, you know, have we helped develop that skill set? We've also done a similar one around mammography screening. Um, so bringing women together and helping them kind of understand uh, what the, the kind of evidence looks like there. And again, to kind of create a space for them to start to think through before they have to make a decision about what may be important to them. And then of course, the last one, the sort of big one, um, is uh, all the things that are outside that are pushing on this encounter. Um, and that's the place really where we're most interested in trying to move towards and thinking about how do we uh, affect uh, action in terms of system redesign and policy um, that will change the nature uh, that is necessary ultimately um, to get to the kind of careful and kind care that we're kind of interested in. Um, and when we think about the sort of systems redesign and policy piece, we're thinking about staffing and workflow decision making and communication and reward systems and policies. And how are all of those things uh, impacting the way that kind of clinicians and patients are able to kind of come together. And so as, as part of this work, we've been doing a larger kind of project engaging with um, uh, a whole primary care clinic um, and the care teams and the sort of scheduling teams associated um, with, uh, with those areas uh, to uh, recenter um, their systems design on um, care and the idea of longitudinal healing relationships. And what does that look like? A co-design effort, because again, we think that um, one of the things with that project that we began to sort of notice was that um, the, how many times in healthcare now, the, um, when patients reach out, the answer is no. I'm sorry, we don't have any appointments available for you. Um, no, we can't see you for that on this particular day. And how demoralizing that is both to patients and to staff. Um, and so we're working, that's an, offer, that's an example of kind of working within um, within the system to understand, can we kind of engage with that type of culture change? Um, we also, if any, any of you who might know um, uh, Victor or have heard Victor speak, uh, Victor is a real like, burn it to the ground, build it to the ground guy. So, <laughs> so we've also kind of been exploring that, that space as well. Um, and we're looking to, uh, we're, we're putting into place the idea of a, um, a care fellowship that will actually invite people to begin to work with us to address this level of um, the challenge in particular, to bring expertise around these different areas to help us think beyond um, the kind of way that the systems work right now and imagine what that might look like in the future. Uh, and so as we kind of um, close, uh, I'll sort of bring you back to this idea of the conversation. Um, and the idea about what it, means and what we want out of a kind of healthcare, um, out of a, a healthcare system. Um, and that really it is about creating these kind of spaces where people can begin to kind of come together. And as you think about the, um, the story that you, uh, or the memory that you were sort of reflecting on in the beginning, um, when, one thing I'll, I'll potentially uh, ask you all to do, if you're kind of interested, 
uh, is we created, a, as part of our work is we try to understand what are the things that um, make it hard for clinicians and patients to be able to come together. And we created a set of barrier columns. So we have these eight barriers for patients, and then I'll click, we also have eight barriers for um, clinicians. Um, and these are things that, that kind of make it um, challenging to be able to kind of engage and kind of connect with each other. And I think each one of these represents an opportunity um, for programs and interventions and tools that help clinicians and patients be able to kind of overcome these. And I'll give you a sense, this is the kind of uh, clinician one as well. And so I'll invite you to, oftentimes when we do this exercise, I ask people to do just what I did with you all in the beginning, think about a, 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 a visit that stands out, a conversation that stands out in your mind, and then select the cards that are relevant to that particular visit. And then I ask them to tell me the story, why did they pick those cards, to tell me the story of why did they pick those cards. And because the work that we're doing, I think, is so kind of centered on this idea of um, awareness and beginning to kind of understand the importance um, and what's happening in those conversations that kind of seem um, Wrote, and I, I think one of the things for me uh, is so challenging is that like your conversations with your doctor are both banal, but um, you know you probably have had many of them and haven't necessarily paid a lot of attention to them. But they're also kind of like a black box. You know your own, but you don't necessarily know anyone else's. And so I think opening up that space is a real opportunity for people to see conversations that kind of place of action. And so I invite you, if you feel comfortable, on our website, there's an opportunity to tell us your stories, which we're trying to collect and add into our story library. Um, and so if you feel moved, uh, you can certainly take these barrier cards and then um, engage, uh, go to the website and um, be able to tell us your story and which ones of these kind of stood out to you. Um, and why and how is it making, how is it having you reflect on your uh, conversation with your clinician or your conversation with your patient if you are a clinician. Um, and with that, uh, I'll sort of bring it to a close. This is my information, uh, patientrevolution.org, our website and also our Twitter. Um, I'm kind of a social media uh, dummy. But, um, uh, but you please, uh, please feel free to tweet us. We'd love to sort of stay uh, in contact. Um, our chair, Victor Bontori, wrote a book called Why We Revolt, which lays out the manifesto of um, the patient revolution in a series of essays. Uh, and so if you've been excited about this, you can certainly um, sort of uh, follow along and read there uh, and sign up for our newsletter to hear about our coming new programs as they happen. So thank you. You know, great. Um, I'm going to steal a whole bunch of stuff from you. Know, <laughs> right. Biology plus biography right. is my new favorite. Oh, good, good. Steal, 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 steal. That's wonderful. So, can people, if people want to see the cards or something? Yes, else, they're, 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 they're on, on the website. website. Yes, if you go to patientrevolution.org slash tools. Yeah. Great. So, we have time for a couple of questions. If people have questions that they want to ask Maggie. <laughs>
um, because that's how we get to healing and care by working hard to yeah. stick the cards out in the waiting room. Great. Right. Yes. That if you want to do that, the young adults, <laughs> reach right? out to me. Like, yeah. So. We need that permission also to, I would to challenge faith. I would love what the that. doctor is saying. So if they just saw a card out in the waiting room and it gave them some ideas about, hey, you can ask questions and challenge, and it's okay, they would maybe help to produce a more productive conversation. I, I would love that. I think, um, you know, one of the areas I'm, most, I'm really interested in this work is I think, you know, patients have uh, rightly, I understand the way they feel this, but feel like they don't have a lot of permission to kind of like bring things necessarily into the space. and. So there's really nobody stopping that. So, um, so if you, these tools, a lot of them were designed for clinicians, but I'm like, there's no reason you can't take the depression medication cards into your doctor and say, hey, I wanna talk about my depression medication and I want you to use these. And I actually think that can be such an extraordinary, powerful way to help clinicians recognize the value of these types of things. So that's absolutely true. Oh yeah, um, I'm Gloria Platel. Um, I thought I really liked um, how you have a new um, conversation as a place of action, where you pull together people and have preparatory discussions, whether they've been diagnosed, not been diagnosed, know somebody who may be, you know, testing to see what's coming up, and have those opportunities for people to come together and talk about their needs. Um, you know, based on my own, and family member and friends and such, uh, that is so necessary. And I think for those of us who work in the field, we're much more comfortable having those conversations with clinicians than people who don't work in the field. That's a great point. I would love to see those conversations spread. Um, and I'm wondering where, how you pull together your people you know, where do you get them from? Um, what organizations, you know, in the community do you reach out to to do that? So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so we, um, the initial work we kind of developed, a lot of the program work uh, we sort of developed through grants um, and collaborations um, in that, uh, the instance with the cardiovascular health uh, and also the mammography screening, we've been working with some clinicians um, at Yale. Um, and uh, in all honesty, it's been, um, a little bit kind of catch as catch can <laughs> um, as we work to use the design process to prototype and develop it until we kind of understand and feel confident enough that these are the things that kind of make it work and then we can imagine kind of how to package it or kind of put it out there. Big part of the ethos of patient revolution is we want to make the things um, and then be able to give them to other people, to get them into the world. That's by far the most important thing. So I think we're in the process of kind of figuring that out. Um, but we are always looking for ways to say yes. So if you have a community of people that you're really interested in, in bringing this to, reach out and we will tug our networks and figure out if we can do a prototype, if we can kind of try something out. Um, I think we, uh, you know, the biggest problem is that we're a really super tiny little team. I'm the director and Melissa's the other four. Um, <laughs> of the patient revolution. Um, uh, but, you know, one thing that we're trying to do with this kind of fellowship is to kind of think about how we grow it and how we kind of move it in different spaces. And we're also trying to, we've seen such power in the, um, what happens when people come together. We think the social component of these events is um, a, a really big part of it. So we're trying to imagine how we can bring it into digital spaces without losing that component, recognizing that that would allow us to spread um, much more easily, um, but, no, but wanting to make sure that it doesn't become, we don't want somebody to have a conversation with a, uh, an app. We want them to be able to engage with a group of people because we've seen how important that is. So it, it's a work in progress, but you know, we look for collaborators and try to find ways to Looks like we have no questions on this side of the room. I'm going to ask more questions or make a suggestion. First of all, that's fantastic. And as a doctor, I can tell you that I would love to have these conversations with patients, and I'm constantly frustrated by the limitations that the system puts on me in terms of the amount of time that we have to spend with patients. But I want patients to be more prepared for these discussions. But I, I would also add, I, I love, also love what Bert called out, which is the biology plus uh, biography. Yeah. But I would add also geography. 
right. which is where people live, and that's sort of uh, you know that's a huge social you know determinant of uh, of people's health and where they're coming from, and so so sort of representing that social economic thing, uh, whatever it is, is is also very important. But thank you, great 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 talk. Absolutely. Hi. Um, a couple of years ago, I think it was in two thousand eleven. I think I was uh, taking uh, the Tufts Digital Health um, uh, Summit with Lisa Gualtieri at her, her Digital Health Institute, Summer Institute. I heard that there was a movement towards group appointments, clinical group appointments. And I forget whether it was Harvard Vanguard or which health system was doing it. And wondered if you're looking at that model um, of bringing people together. Yeah, we, we haven't necessarily focused on that um, uh, exactly, uh, our group hasn't, but it's certainly kind of been in the waters of the places that, um, uh, that we're uh, looking at. And I think it is a huge opportunity a space to think about um, how you help support the kind of dialogues and conversations that may happen in those spaces. Um, you know, one big thing I, I always try and kind of communicate um, uh, I'm very proud of my tools, but I don't think that there is any power in my tools. And hopefully in a, a version of the world in the future, all my tools go away, right? Because the, the value of the tools is what they allow people to do and accomplish when they come together. Um, and so they're only as good as their ability to do that. Uh, they can be, and oftentimes a lot of the ones that we tested in terms of the shared decision-making tools and things, we're really finding that you know, for a number of different reasons, they, they can't, they're not able to be present enough all, at all the time to sort of make those connections happen. And so we have to acknowledge that that alone isn't, isn't kind of a solution. Well, and I think yeah. hearing other people's experiences too, elicits a lot of Exactly. And, uh, and it makes people um, more empathetic. Yeah. I think that's, you know, a big, a big one that I've kind of seen is to recognize that different people can look at the same set of information and reach a different conclusion. Um, and uh, what we've seen that with um, the cardiovascular health events for women making decisions about taking statins, um, and then also for mammography and making decisions about whether or not to get mammography screening, especially in your 40s. And I think that is a, there's a huge opportunity there to be doing a public service of helping people understand that there's a lot of ambiguity and different people can kind of process that in different ways. Okay. Thank you so much. We're, we have, have another quick session and then we're going to have a break. So I think Maggie will still be here. Yes, I will. Yeah. Thank so. you all so much. Society for Participatory Medicine Manifesto. We needed to add more words. Um, <laughs> so, the, the manifest, so I wanted to talk quickly about why we did it, how we did it, and then get off the board and be talking and get a little bit more uh, personal and relatable. So, one thing we, we came into the year is that we really realized that we need to explain exactly what we stand for and what it is that we mean and what we mean to the world. And we, um, decided to do this type of work uh, on uh, the manifesto, but the goal for us wasn't to do uh, a, you know, a Unabomber manifesto. <laughs> for those who remember that. <laughs> Our goal was to do something that was short and simple, but really relatable and personable. I mean, I might still do a Unabomber manifesto. I mean, that's, a uh, that's a different conference that I'll be presenting um, in jail. Probably. I know. But the, the biggest issue for us, like I said, was to make it personable and relatable. And, and we started this effort last year, last year's conference, and I don't, I don't remember how many people were here last year, but we did this exercise towards the end of the day that we collected a lot of I will statements, we categorized it by caregiver, by patient, by healthcare professional, and we went through that process and we got a ton of input from everybody, not just SPN members, but even other people at the conference last year and other ways, 
And we actually, um, oh my god, I can say congealed it, but that's not called it. Thank you. Synthesized it. <laughs> yeah, I congealed it. I don't know what's wrong with me. So far, but, uh, yeah, I, I think I need one of Maggie's cards to help me figure out how to speak keep up sometimes. But, um, so we synthesize it into the card that you'll see. And um, the front part is really the manifesto itself, so that short paragraph about what it is that we believe and what we want to do. The circles underneath are the categories of ways that we want to make a difference. But the real power, in my mind, is what's on the back. And these are real statements that we got from people. And I'll never forget some of the statements we got last year from the conference. Like We had a physician say, uh, I will no longer just prescribe a, pa a patient a medication because that salesperson was in the office that week. Right? Like we actually got stuff like that. It was like real, real personal stuff. So this was really important to us. Um, and what was also really important to us is that this wasn't, I know my name is there, Judy's name is there, uh, Judy Danielson, for those who haven't met, is on the board and runs all of our marketing. It's, it's truly amazing. Um, but we didn't write this, right? Like it was written by a lot of people, and I might argue it was the first crowdsourced deliverable from uh, the society. So that's why it's on the table, and that's why it's important. Um, I think the uh, we actually have a short video that we want to show. Just flip slides. Just flip slides. It's always that easy with technology and conferences, right? <laughs> okay, let's try. This one's not as good as Eric's, just letting you know. <laughs> This assignment for participatory medicine is reimagining the dynamics of healthcare as we design our participatory manifesto. So join us. I promise you. Share and listen. To respect one another. Share information responsibly. Promote curiosity. And be a team leader. My name is Danny Sands, and I'm a primary care physician. I will help my patients access and understand the information they need to engage in their care. Hi, my name is Deb Gordon. I'm a recovering health plan executive, now consumer, and advocate for healthcare consumers. I pledge to advocate for myself and my loved ones by questioning my healthcare professionals. My name is John Danielson, and I am a caregiver for my wife, Gail, who has Alzheimer's. I will ask questions of healthcare professionals and voice my own concerns and opinions. As a healthcare professional, I will learn and respect patients' goals, values, and preferences. My name is Joe Ternelli, and I am the co-chair of the Society for Participatory Medicine, and I will play an active role on the care team as a patient or a caregiver. This is John Hoban with the Society for Participatory Medicine. As a patient, I will be prepared to share my story and experiences completely, accurately, and honestly. <laughs> 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 I really need to know where I can find an active role on the kids. My name is Bert Rosen. I'm invited to promote curiosity and be truthful with healthcare professionals even when it's uncomfortable. And to always navigate it for myself by questioning healthcare professionals and letting them know. My name is Sabiola Kamani. I am a nursing student. I will play an active role as a patient or a caregiver. I will reach out to other caregivers around and take care of myself so I can take care of others. I will treat my patients and their caregivers like partners, peers, and collaborators. <clears throat> As healthcare professionals, patients, and caregivers, we have all pledged our commitment to the Participatory Medicine Manifesto. Will you? I will. I will. I will. Join us today and join the movement. We can and we will transform the culture of healthcare. Yeah. <laughs> so Amber, who spilled last of the video, put that video together for us. So. <laughs> and there's no question that John Hoban went this smile. Um so uh, again, for us, we really wanted to make it relatable and personal, and, and hopefully when you read the language, like, it's the way you would talk, right? Like, we didn't want it to sound clinical, we didn't want it to sound overly scripted or jargon. So, um, the one thing I ask quickly, because we're already behind, of course, um, is uh, if anybody's read the manifesto and, like, and really likes it, and, like, read any of the I will statements that it kind of speaks to them uh, in any way that they might feel uh, 
uh, inspired. Uh, it would be great if they wanted to share. Oh, great. Where's your point? Right here. We always put the troublemakers up front. Yeah. Um, oh, wait. So, no, that takes the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> so, one of the things I know in, in all of this is you talk about uh, healthcare providers and you talk about patients. How many of us are healthcare technologists in the room? There's a number of us. Um, and I think healthcare technologists have a special role in this space. One of the things that, that I have said repeatedly is that in my work in healthcare technology, I am working for myself, my family and my community first, and then my customers and my company. And in that order. So that's, that's the way I think about uh, what I do in this particular space. And you're gonna hear about some standards work uh, this afternoon that I work on, and I think that uh, in that healthcare technology, some of the standards that are coming out uh, are starting to reflect that notion. Great, thank you. Thank you. Do you have an I will statement? Well, that was my I will. I want to know what you said. I will. We need okay. To I, will, I will, as a healthcare technologist, work for myself, my family, and my community first, my customers, and then my company. And in that order. Yeah. Okay. So we have Nancy over here. Yeah. Oh. Run, Danny, run. Yeah. <laughs> run this morning. This is what we yeah. did just to make Danny. Happy to run this morning. Yep. So um, I I really am in support of this manifesto. Oh, I'm in support of this manifesto. I'm an author and a healthcare journalist. So I write about healthcare issues, particularly digital communication in healthcare. And I personally advocate in my own way um, for collaboration and coordination among patients and the care team. And as uh, an I will statement, um, I would say that I will practice what I preach as a uh, patient, as a communicator, and as a person at, at the time when it was necessary as a caregiver to uh, fulfill all of the um, different aspects of the manifesto that I believe in. Uh, it's my odd hope that participatory medicine itself will become a standard way of practicing medicine as we forge ahead in the 21st century. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Oh, I got it. Run, <laughs> Hi, my name is Lisa Smith. I swear it's my real name. Um, <laughs> I'm a patient, a communicator, uh, and an inveterate nerd. And as somebody who has been in several different roles in that, I wholeheartedly support the manifesto and can say very honestly that when I have had conversations with clinicians according to this model that, that are very much in the spirit of this, I get great results. And they get great results. I'm able to translate patient experiences in a meaningful way for clinicians, and they are able to, to tease out of me information that helps them not only help me, but helps the next patient in line. It's win-win whenever we can create the conditions that make this possible. And if, you know, I'm a communicator and a systems freak, so I look at you know, the meta level. How can I describe this to another patient like me who hasn't been here yet? Um, talking with other clinicians and researchers and advocates like that. I think this is a wonderful idea and the more we can make this philosophy not only common sense in terms of delivering medicine, but also arranging the systems to support it, y'all got to run. I will. Thank you. I will. I will absolutely use whatever skills I have to further the acceptance and adoption of this manifesto and everything it means so that patients, clinicians, and everyone else in the process will have a better tomorrow than yesterday. You're hired. <laughs> I'm the founder of Pal Channel, 
animal or the creator, colon town. Disease specific, obviously, community. Pal, pal represents patient action lead. Town represents the way we attract patients. And uh, we're about to launch many other tumor types as town in the same model as colon town, which has been very, very successful. Now, what we're going to do with this manifesto, we, we work by this manifesto. I just hadn't seen it in writing before, and I'm thrilled to see it. We train patients to become their own leaders and to help others lead others, and it goes on and on and on. And if it's okay with you all, I'd like to incorporate the manifesto ideas yeah. into everything that we do. I assume that you're wanting that to happen. Yes. The metal is what we give our graduating patient leaders. The people wear these proudly at all the conferences. Almost as proudly as you guys are wearing the genus jackets. I have a couple too, so. But I wanted you to see my medal. I will. I will do everything. How's that? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so if, uh, if there's a bunch of cards on the table, obviously, if you want the electronic version, if you go to participatorymedicine.org slash manifesto, it's there. Oh, well, yeah. That's where you go, but I think it also is on a slide that says that. Uh, whatever. Okay. Um, so, what I want to do that, yeah, so just go to that URL and you'll find it. Or you can obviously ask any of us to. Um, so, what I want to do next is uh, a manifesto. Uh, this was actually amazing. Thank you for everybody who said something, right? Because what we don't want the manifesto to be is just a piece of paper that we show at a conference and that is like nicely designed, right? Like, that doesn't matter. It's the words that actually matter and the actions that the words drive that really matter. So, I want to introduce Jan Oldenburg who's going to come up and talk a little bit about uh, a focus for the society that we're working on, a, a big signature initiative that obviously aligns with the manifesto and a lot of the ways we've been. So, thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, we have just had a great demonstration of the kinds of action steps that patient revolution is taking to make this vision of a participatory medicine world real. And in the society, as part of the theme of moving toward action, that's one of the things that we are looking to do. What are the action steps we should be taking to in fact move us forward um, and create a world in which we have the kind of care that we all dream of? So I'm uh, heading up a signature initiative, uh, initiative, I can read that again, um, for SPM, which is really looking at what are the things that we should be investing in? What's the initiative that should drive and define who we are and help move things forward? So our goals are for it to be action-oriented, for it to involve people within the society and the creation, as well as people outside, for it to be a big enough vision that it helps encompass what we are and uh, how we're going about it, but also that it drives real change in incremental steps. So we've had um, a really healthy discussion on Connect, and I encourage you, if you haven't seen it, to go out and just search initiative. We had a town hall talking about it. And we're really at the stage of saying, okay, we've had a lot of discussion. It's time to get to really framing it. I'm looking for a committee to work with me on it. Um, you don't um, certainly encourage you to be a society member, but you wouldn't have to be because we want it to be appealing to people who are not in the society um, as well as people who are. Um, we envision it as something that will gain the attention and um, the uh, support of people on a broader basis that we can use to actually move things forward. So if you're interested in being a part of it or a part of the steering committee, please uh, contact me. Twitter is at Jen Oldenburg. Email Jen at JenOldenburg.com. Um, and let me know that you're interested and I'll incorporate you into 
at either the steering committee or in the broader discussion groups. So thanks. All right, I have a couple of uh, brief announcements before I lead us into uh, a break. Oh, wait, let's get it there. Um, so, um, first announcement is for the speakers, and I want to ask that you rec Chris, raise your hand over here. This is Chris. Chris is our videographer uh, who is recording for our live stream. And so, when the speakers are up here, I ask that you take a look at uh, that good looking guy over there with the big beard, <laughs> ZZ Top beard. Um, so, he's, he's got the camera, so that way we are Facebook Live people are, are uh, more engaged in this uh, 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 conference. Okay, second thing, I've forgotten in my introduction. We have some members of media here. We have people here on press passes, and they are both doing active uh, uh, engagement with their social media followers and also writing after the event. And some of them actually want to talk to you. Uh, they want to find individuals who want to talk to them. So if you're a member of the press, or here as a member of the press, please stand up so we can recognize you. Now let's give my hand. These are uh, great folks. Great. So grab those people, talk to them if you want to be famous. And, uh, and I, I would point out that one of those people who stood up is Gunter Eisenbach, who is the uh, editor-in-chief of the, um, uh, the Journal of Medical Internet Research. And that is the publishing uh, umbrella under which the uh, Journal of Participatory Medicine is published. So uh, thank you, Gunter, for being here with the team. All right, and the, the last announcement I have before we send, I send us off is that there is a, we're running about 15 minutes behind. The panel that I'm on, which is gonna, was supposed to be 10.30, now will be at 10.45. Uh, I need to see all of you so we can connect, and I have something for each of you. So as soon as we get to the break. And with that, let me make sure I don't have anything else I got here. Oh, it's my other there we go. And so now we're on networking break. We will reconvene uh, by 10.45. Don't be late, we're gonna have a fun panel. This is very exciting, thank you all. See you soon. Recognize that We Go Health and Inspire sponsored the break. We Go Health and Inspire. Great. So thank you to our sponsors. Thank you to all of our viewers. We're going to take a few minutes for a break and then we'll be done. Let's do it.